Tonight on Why News. Bureau of Corrections Director Nicanor Faildon says the release of convicted rapist and murderer Antonio Sanchez may take several years. Senators seek probe on the reduced sentence of former Calawan Mayor Antonio Sanchez. Foreign Affairs Secretary Teodoro Luxin Jr. confirms that the Philippines has filed a diplomatic protest against China over its warships passing the Philippine waters without informing the country's authorities. The National Economic and Development Authority urged Congress to pass the proposed 2020 national budget on time so as to not weaken the country's economic growth further. And school children undergo basic first aid and support training with UNTV Rescue Team. Good evening, former Kalawan Laguna Mayor Antonio Sanchez's liberty remains bleak for this year. Sherwin Kulabong tells us why. Bureau of Corrections Director Nicanor Pildon showed today former Kalawan Laguna Mayor Antonio Sanchez to the members of the media to refute spreading rumors that the former town chief executive has already gone home. Pildon assures that the detained Sanchez will not be given liberty this year. This is because of his violations while inside the new believed prisons. Preliminary, because there are a lot of involvement in some not good behaviors. Eh, baka hindi nga siya qualified. That, that's really the probability. He may not really qualify to go home today or in the next few months. Or, mukhang di siya mapapasok agad. Baka abutin pa siya ng several years. According to File Don, Sanchez was caught with illegal drugs in his cell. A heavy case inside the NBP. As far as the beer is concerned, dahil nahuli yan talaga dun sa kubul niya noong 2006, as far as we are concerned, uh, legal yung pagkakahuli sa kanya. Hindi yan, ano, so official na nahuli siya. So that may definitely disqualify him for good conduct time around. The now 73-year-old former mayor also consistently showed negative attitude towards his fellow inmates, plus a luxurious life behind bars. The document section of the BU Corps will conduct a recomputation for Sanchez. Recently, uh, 2015 yata, yung kanyang kubol ay uh, luxurious. Uh, while the rest are sleeping under the sun, uh, he's living. You know, so, para sa akin, for a, a prisoner to have done that, you have also violated some rules here. Yes. So, uh, consistent. So, pag uh, minainos natin yan, uh, definitely, wala siyang ma-earn na uh, good conduct time. Yes, sir. Sanchez has served 26 years in prisons since his arrest in 1993 due to the rape and murder of two UP Los Baños students, Aileen Sarmenta and Alan Gomez. Sherwin Kulubong, UNTV News and Rescue, Muntinlupa City. Some senators are not in favor of the possible release of convicted ex-Kalawan Mayor Antonio Sanchez. Senate President Vicente Soto III wants to amend the revised penal code to disqualify convicts of heinous crimes from getting pardon and parole. Grace Cassin explains why. For Senator Franklin Dirilon and Senate President Vicente Soto III, former Kalawan Laguna Mayor Antonio Sanchez is not qualified to be pardoned or granted parole for good behavior. Possession of illegal drugs is good behavior. Being involved in the Shabu trade would disqualify him. Would not be, that would not be considered as good conduct. Senator Drilon was the Secretary of Justice when Sanchez was convicted. He calls on the Bureau of Corrections to stop the release of the ex-mayor. Kung talagang ipipilit nila, I would uh, uh, assist the Sarmienta family to bring the case before the regular courts. They question natin yung... The, exercise of that discretion to release Antonio Sanchez. Senate President Vicente Soto III meanwhile warns the official of Bureau of Pardon and Parole and the Bureau of Corrections. They may face charges if they commit mistakes in computing the good conduct time allowance of Sanchez. Kapag sila ay hindi nag-comply sa law or nagkaroon ng maling computation, they can be subject to one year imprisonment and 100,000 uh, pesos uh, uh, fine or perpetual disqualification from office. 
So, pati ito sa mga nagko-compute ng mali, abay, mananagot pa sila. Senator Soto and Rilon plan to file a bill for the upper house to investigate the possible release of Sanchez. The Senate President also plans to amend Republic Act No. 10592 or the revised penal code to disqualify convicts of heinous crimes from getting pardon or being granted parole. As a classified na heinous crime, hindi dapat mag-qualify. Dapat reclusion perpetua ka. Total, ayaw nyo ng death penalty. O oh, sige, reclusion perpetua ka. You die in your cell. Grace Kassin, UNTV News and Rescue, Senate of the Philippines. Malacanang agrees there must be thorough investigation to determine if ex-Mayor Antonio Sanchez indeed deserves to be a free man due to good behavior. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. The public has criticized the reports on the possible early release from imprisonment of former Kalawan Laguna Mayor Antonio Sanchez, a convicted rapist and murderer. Around 11,000 inmates, including Sanchez, might be granted freedom under a new law which increases good conduct time allowance for inmates. This means the inmate sentence could be reduced because of good behavior. However, many question how can he qualify for good conduct when he was caught with illegal drugs in his detention, has been living lavishly in prison and refused to heed the court's order to pay damages for the crimes he committed. Dapat yung committee was ever in charge. They should consider everything. The Department of Justice has ordered extensive review and recomputation of good conduct time allowances of inmates with heinous and high-profile cases. The presidential spokesperson has refused to answer if Sanchez deserves a second chance. He insists that imprisonment is reformatory and those who have reformed themselves and rejoined society must be given a second chance. Secretary Panelo was one of the Sanchez's defense lawyers. The palace also argues the law was not passed during the Duterte administration. If we have any concern on the wisdom of the law, then it should be addressed to the lawmakers. That law was passed during the administration of President Benigno Aquino. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue, Malacanã. Some are putting blame on the current administration for the looming release from prison of former Kalawan Laguna Mayor Antonio Sanchez, who was meted with seven life sentences for the rape and murder of a UP student, student in 1995. A legal expert, however, thinks otherwise. Let's find out why from Roderick Mendoza. Seemingly hatched in hell, this is how the Supreme Court described the gruesome crime as it affirmed in 1999 the conviction of former Kalawan Laguna Mayor Antonio Sanchez for the rape and murder of UP Los Baños student Aileen Sarmenta and the killing of her companion Alan Gomez in 1993. But how is it that almost 25 years after his conviction, Sanchez is going to walk free from the new Bilibid prison under the revised penal code, the maximum imprisonment which can be imposed on a convicted felon is 40 years. Jail term can be reduced if the convict has shown good behavior while serving his sentence under the good conduct time allowance. But is it possible that Malacanang Palace has a hand on the looming release of Sanchez considering Presidential Spokesperson Secretary Salvador Panelo was his lawyer? Hindi na kailangan ng kahit na sinong tao mag-intervene o lumakan sa release kasi merong patas na na-benefit yung si Mr. Sanchez sa kayo labing isang libo pa. Justice Secretary Menardo Guevara says, Recomputing Sanchez's good conduct time allowance is purely ministerial since it is mandated by the law and a Supreme Court decision. Good conduct time allowance and jail term reduction are provided for under the revised penal code. In 2013, then-President Benigno Aquino III signed into law Republic Act 10592, increasing the number of days which may be deducted from an inmate's sentence under the GCTA. Last June, the Supreme Court said this new law should be applied retroactively, meaning it should also benefit inmates who were convicted before it took effect. 
A law dean says it is too early to tell if indeed Sanchez will now be released from prison along with almost 11,000 other inmates, some of whom might have committed graver offense than him. Uh, masyadong napaka-premature ang lahat. Bakit napaka-premature? Kasi po mga kasambahay, wala pa namang nilalabas na listahan eh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wala pang nilalabas na listahan ang Department of Justice sa pamamagitan ng Bureau of Parols and Pardons. Mm-hmm. Hindi pa siya naglalabas, nagko-compute pa sila sa kasalukuyan. Mm-hmm. And if there is somebody to blame here, it is the Congress who passed the bill, the President who signed it into law. Yung Bureau of Corrections ay walang magagawa kung hindi mm-hmm. magpatupad po ng ating batas. Mm-hmm. Ha, wala siyang choice kung hindi ipatupad ang batas. Wala rin kasalanan po si spokesperson Panelo in oh, fairness oh. sa kanya dahil batas po yan. Oh, ha, oh. Ang sisihin natin, bakit na ipasa ang batas? Oh, oh. Ang sisihin exactly. natin, no? bakit napirmahan ang batas na yan? But on the other hand, there is no question that the law will benefit inmates who had really turned from their dark past. Roderick Mendoza, UNTV News and Rescue. Former Justice Secretary Vitaliano Aguirre II believes that the possible credit of good conduct for ex-Kalawan Mayor Antonio Sanchez should be studied thoroughly. Aguirre says there is no question in implementing the law, but other alleged crimes that were tagged against Sanchez should be looked into in computing his good behavior credit. These include the smuggling of Shabu inside a Virgin Mary statue inside his jail and another murder case where he was also convicted while serving his sentence for the Sarmienta Gomez slay. Former DOJ chief says this calls for an accurate computation from the Bureau of Paroles and Pardons. Despite all these uh, two instances, yan ba uh, good behavior na yan at pwedeng hindi consider sa computation ng uh, kanyang uh, benefit for good behavior. So yan, I think uh, it should be one. It should be uh, uh, studied and uh, computed correctly. Did you know there is an existing Philippine law that upholds teaching basic life support to elementary and high school students? And that is the very concept the UNTV Rescue Team promotes through its ongoing basic first aid training for school children. Find out why as Monoxon reports. Grade for student gives first aid to injured motorcycle rider. What a headline, right? And this is not impossible. Recently, the UNTV Rescue Team have intensified their training for elementary and high school students on basic first aid and support training. More than 400 students joined the training on how to save lives in Bayugo National High School and Infant Jesus Academy in Rizal Province. Sa case ko po nun, nung hindi ko pa alam kung paano yung dapat gawin in case of emergency, maaaring lalong mapahamak yung pasyente na makasalamuha ko. Pero ngayon, dahil po sa seminar na tinulong ng UNTV, nagkaroon po ako ng kaalaman na lahat po ay pwede maging lifesaver. Bata man, matanda, kahit sino man ay pwede maging lifesaver. Ang pag-aaral ng first aid and basic life support training ay nagsisilbing impormasyon sa paghahanda sa mga posibleng mangyari na sakuna. Walang pinipili ang sakuna at ito'y pag-udyok sa atin na dapat tayo maging handa dahil ito talaga yung malaking bagay. Nabigyan ako ng kalakasan na mas maging handa sa mga posibleng mangyari na sakuna. While the Supreme Student Government Officers of Mandawi City Central School in Cebu Province were joined by their teachers in another first aid training. For comprehensive information and procedure on basic first aid treatment like how to treat a head injury, how to treat a fracture, and what you should have inside your go bag. The Lifesaver YouTube channel is readily available using your mobile phone or your computer. On Facebook, you can also follow Lifesaver and learn online. Remember, there is always something you can do to help. Don't be a bystander! Be a Lifesaver! Mon Hoxon, UNTV News and Rescue. Welcome back to Why News. We pick up to where Angelo Castro III left off. I'm Alex Baltazar, and here are the headlines. 
Foreign Affairs Secretary Teodoro Luxin Jr. confirms the Philippines has filed a diplomatic protest against China over its warships passing Philippine waters without informing the country's authorities. President Rodrigo Duterte insists he will raise the arbitral ruling that favors the Philippines in the disputed territories in the West Philippine Sea when he visits China next week. The National Economic and Development Authority urges Congress to pass the proposed 2020 national budget on time so as to not to further weaken economic growth. Signal number one raced over some parts of Luzon due to tropical storm Ineng. And a visually impaired composer and a food vendor showcase their talents at the Wishkabri Season 3 on ground editions Davo City Leg. Good evening. Former Foreign Affairs Secretary Perfecto Yasai Jr. was arrested on Thursday afternoon after a court in Manila issued a warrant for allegedly violating various banking laws. Reports from the Manila Police District said that Yasai's arrest was ordered by Judge Danilo Leva, presiding judge of Regional Trial Court Branch 10 in the city of Manila. Yasai is accused of violating Republic Acts 8791 and 7653 or the General Banking Law and the New Central Bank Act for his involvement in an anomalous loan from Banco Filipino Savings and Mortgages Bank. In a Facebook post, the former secretary confirmed that he was arrested. However, he insisted that he was not yet part of Banco Filipino when the crime happened. Yasai said that it occurred in 2003 to 2006, while he claims to have joined the bank only in 2009. He also said that he will likely spend the night in MPD's detention facility as he would not post bail until he is brought before the said judge. Yasai was President Rodrigo Duterte's first Department of Foreign Affairs chief until the Commission on Appointments denied his ad interim appointment because of questions about his citizenship. Foreign Affairs Secretary Teodoro Luxin Jr. assures a diplomatic protest over the passage of Chinese warships in the Cebu Strait has been fired off. Aiko Miguel details why. We just fired off. That's it. DFA Secretary Teddy Luxin Jr. confirms that another diplomatic protest has been filed against Chinese incursion. Last Monday, in his tweet to the Department of Foreign Affairs Office of Asia and Pacific Affairs, he ordered doing so. And on Monday's Senate hearing, he said, Fire off another. We'll never run out of those. And uh, in doing so, please make it explicit, the message, and to drop diplomatic language. Based on the Armed Forces of the Philippines' Western Mindanao Command's report, two Chinese warships were seen passing through Philippine waters in July and three this month. Secretary Luxin reiterates that Chinese warships' action is clearly trespassing as they were not permitted to enter the Philippine territory. I already described my foreign policy as the fist and the iron glove of the Armed Forces. So we work hand in hand with the military. The official hopes the issue will be tackled during President Rodrigo Duterte's working visit in China this month to implement the necessary move on the matter. The Foreign Affairs Chief adds they are still working on the agenda in the meetings between President Duterte and his Chinese counterpart. Working on that now, actually. Aiko Miguel, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The National Economic Development Authority asks the House of Representatives to pass the proposed 2020 national budget before the end of this year. Joanano details why. The lower house is kick off the deliberations of the 4.1 trillion peso proposed 2020 national budget. National Economic Development Authority Director General Ernesto Perña asked the lawmakers to pass the proposed 2020 national budget before the end of this year. We look forward to the timely passage of the 2020 national budget so as not to derail our next year's economic growth. Based on the proposed budget calendar released by the Committee on Appropriations, the target is to come up with a committee report in the second week of September and approve the proposed national budget in the third and final reading by October 4. I encourage everyone, my colleagues, to join us in this yearly exercise of scrutinizing and dissecting the people's budget and perform the mandate entrusted to us by our constituents 
to prioritize the early enactment of the General Appropriations Act before the start budget year 2020. The administration's economic managers have projected a 6.5 to 7.5 growth in gross domestic product by 2020. According to Pernia, this can be attained if the national budget is approved on or before the end of this year. Neda hopes that the delay in the passage of the budget will not happen again this year. Joanna no UNTV News and Rescue, House of Representatives. The Zamboanga City Health Office has already recorded 4,500 dengue cases and mortality since January to present this year. Dante Amento will tell us why. Zamboanga City remains under a state of calamity. This, as the dengue rate in its barangays continue to rise. Last month, the City Health Office recorded 3,000 cases, but this number has increased to about 4,500 with 26 deaths. This is already more than double the total number of dengue cases recorded last year, which is 1,995. Of the 98 barangays in the city, 10 have recorded 100 to over 200 cases. For the top 10 barangays that we did, the larvae that we get are 80% to 90% Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus uh, larvae. So these are dengue carrier mosquitoes. With this, the City Health Office appeals to the residents and barangay officials to continue and intensify their campaign against dengue. Uh, every 4 o'clock, stop, get out of the house to have to do search and destroy and listen to our barangay officials for other activities in the barangay. The City Health Office also vowed to intensify their information dissemination in barangays to spread awareness of the often fatal disease. City health officers also advise the public to bring the patients immediately to the hospital if they are experiencing the symptoms. Dante Amento, UNTV News and Rescue, Sambuanga City. Former Justice Secretary Vitaliano Aguirre has filed a libel complaint against Special Envoy for Public Diplomacy to China, Ramon Tulfo, and five others. This is in connection with the accusations thrown against him, written by Tulfo in at least five alleged malicious articles. One of the accusations Aguirre denied is being a protector of a human trafficking syndicate at the Ninoy Aquino International Airport. Aguirre stresses these are all lies of the Manila Times columnist who is one of his former clients. Earlier this month, Executive Secretary Salvador Medialdea also filed a libel complaint against Tulfo. Well, alam mo itong si Ramon Tulfo, walang kadaladala yan eh. Uh, kahit puro kasi ng ulingan, walang bas yan yung kanyang pinapile, ay tuloy-tuloy. At uh, kaya naman akala niya ay eh, tuloy-tuloy kong palalampasin. Well, alam mo itong si Ramon Tulfo, walang kadaladala yan eh. The Philippine National Police will investigate why some security agencies have high-powered firearms despite President Duterte's directive that such firearms are prohibited among civilians. Nina Armilio tells us why. The Philippine National Police urged security agencies across the country to surrender high-powered firearms in their possession. Shotgun is the longest firearm a security agency can possess. If the agencies do not surrender their high-powered weapons, we will just issue cease to operate at hindi namin i-renew yung kanilang license to operate. Itok hang na natin yung may mga high-powered firearms na surrender. Kasi ang tokhang is pakiusap eh. Pakiusap na turn over na nila yung mga high power. So, oplan to kang pa rin. Fajardo made the statement following the attack of New People's Army rebels in the quarry site of Minergy Coal Power Plant. The NPA took five AK-47 assault rifles of the company's five security guards who were then on duty. The PNP Civil Security Group director explains communist rebels might seize and use the firearms against the government forces. His group is also investigating on the possible lapses made by the quarry site's security guards. President na mismo yung nag utos na wala dapat high-powered firearms ang mga different security agencies. Una-una, wala silang high-powered firearms. Kasi uh, hindi naman sila trained to use the high-powered firearms. So, um, i-revoke namin yung mga licenses 
Since 2017, civilians and security agencies have no longer been allowed to possess high-powered and long firearms. Nino Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue. Tropical storm Ineng maintains its strength while slightly slowing down while it moves toward extreme northern Luzon. According to the State Weather Service Pagasa, as of 5 p.m., tropical storm Ineng was observed at 670 kilometers east of Kasiguran, Aurora, packed with maximum sustained winds of 75 kilometers per hour near the center and gustiness of up to 90 kilometers per hour. The weather agency, meanwhile, Raised tropical cyclone wind signal number one over six areas in Luzon, where moderate to occasionally heavy rains will be experienced. Batanes, Cagayan, including Babuyan Group of Islands, Isabela, Apayao, Kalinga, Northern Abra, Ilocos Norte. According to Pagasa, moderate to occasionally heavy rains will affect Bicol region. Northern Samar and Quezon Province throughout the day. The southwest monsoon, meanwhile, will bring light to moderate with intermittent heavy rains in areas of Pangasinan, Zambales, Bataan, Cavite, Batangas, Mindoro Provinces, Northern Palawan, including Calamian and Cuyo Islands, Antique, and Aklan. The weather agency announced also sea travel is risky over the eastern seaboards of southern Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao due to potentially rough sea conditions. Pagasa said tropical storm Ineng is still less likely to make landfall in any part of the country, but it is expected to enhance the southwest monsoon. This rainy weekend can be expected in Luzon. And to complete the most significant news for this day, why news continues, here are the top stories. Residents of Barangay Balingasa in Quezon City complain about illegally parked trucks. But the Quezon City government has made sure the owners of the truck are held liable. Vincent Arboleda will tell us why. Public roads must be free from obstructions by now, right? But this street in Barangay Balingasa in Quezon City has almost no room for passage of other vehicles. Namisan po, napakalit na po ng dinadaanan nila. Eh, ito po ay isang napakalaking uh, daan na pagka po, pwede pong alternative po kasi to. At uh, ang masama po, dito na rin sila nagtatalier. Upon surprise inspection of the Quezon City Transport and Traffic Management Task Force in Harmony Street, some 20 large trucks were illegally parked. The task force fined the owner of the trucks registered to Regan Industrial Sales with 2,000 pesos each. The truck's owner came and promised to remove the large vehicles from the public road. May commitment yung may ari na tatanggalin at pumayag ang barangay na siyang complainant. So okay na kami doon. The truck owner and the barangay captain of Balingasa have come up with an agreement. Because I think this is good for us, no? Na nakaroon ng ng agreement, and then we will, of course, comply. Today is the 25th day of President Rodrigo Duterte's 60-day deadline for Metro Manila chief executives to clear public roads of obstructions. Vincent Arboleda, UNTV News and Rescue, Quezon City. The World Health Organization says microplastics in drinking water do not appear to pose a health risk at current levels, according to the World Health Organization. Beverly Saison explains why. The World Health Organization said microplastics contained in drinking water pose a low risk to human health at current levels, but more research is needed to reassure consumers. Microplastics enter drinking water sources mainly through runoff and wastewater effluent. Evidence shows that microplastics found in some bottled water seem to be at least partly due to the bottling process and or packaging such as plastic caps. Microplastics pose three threats, a physical one, a chemical, and a third is about bacterial colonization. The majority of plastic particles in water are larger than 150 micrometers in diameter. You would probably excrete it, or that chemical might have been released in water in the environment beforehand. WHO technical experts reported that more research needs to be conducted to know more about what is being absorbed, the distribution, and their impacts. 
The chemical hazard, experts have looked at the concentrations found in marine microplastics and chose a worst-case scenario, saying we would ingest the highest possible concentrations. According to the WHO, whatever the chemical, the exposure level was a lot safer than any threshold of risk. I think uh, for consumers, I, I think, um, you know, drink your tap water if you have um, a good supply, a nicely regulated supply, enjoy it. Um, don't be worried about bottled water uh, either. If you're a regulator, we're not recommending that you set standards um, and uh, call for routine monitoring. And if you're a water supplier, please focus on known risks and optimize your wastewater treatment and your drinking water treatment and continue to do those good practice, um, good practices that you should be doing already to remove viruses and bacteria um, and, and chemicals. The WHO said the biggest overall health threat in water is from microbial pathogens, including from human and livestock waste entering water sources that cause deadly diarrheal disease, especially in poor countries lacking water treatment systems. Beverly Saison, UNTV News and Rescue. And for the news abroad, here's Kath Dumaraos reporting live from Bangkok, Thailand. Kath, good evening. Good evening, William. At least one person was killed and eight injured after a fire broke out overnight in a hospital complex on the outskirts of Paris. Video filmed by an eyewitness shows several floors of the Henry Mondor and Cree tail being engulfed in flames after the fire broke out on Wednesday night. The blaze was eventually brought under control in the early hours of Thursday morning. The cause of the fire has not yet been determined. Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro claims that non-governmental organizations may be setting fires in the Amazon to embarrass the Brazilian government after it cut their funding despite offering no evidence to support the claim. Rosalie Cos will tell us why. The Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro has accused environmental groups of setting fires in the Amazon as he tries to deflect growing international criticism of his failure to protect the world's biggest rainforest. Regarding the fires in the Amazon, I am under the impression that it could have been set by the NGOs because they would asked for money. What was their intention? To bring about problems for Brazil? Presented without evidence and disputed by environmental and climate experts, Bolsonaro's comments enraged critics and fanned a growing social media campaign over the dangers to the Amazon, one of the world's key bulwarks against climate change. Pray for Amazonas was the world's top trending topic on Twitter on Wednesday and millions of people took to Instagram and Facebook to share concerns over the future of the Amazon. It is a way of diverting attention and focus from what is the main issue and that is the need to strengthen actions of control in the Amazon for a means to reduce deforestation and not just that a path towards economic alternatives in an economy based on conservation and not on exploitation and the destruction of the forest. Brazil has had more than 72,000 fire outbreaks so far this year, an 84% increase on the same period in 2018, according to the country's National Institute for Space Research. More than half of them were in the Amazon. There was a sharp spike in deforestation during July, which has been followed by extensive burning in August. Local newspapers say farmers in some regions are organizing fire days to take advantage of weaker enforcement by the authorities. Since Bolsonaro took power, the Environment Agency has issued fewer penalties, and ministers have made clear that their sympathies are with loggers rather than the indigenous groups who live in the forest. The head of Brazil's space agency was fired last month after the president disputed the official deforestation data from satellites. Bolsonaro, a longtime skeptic of environmental concerns, wants to open the Amazon to more agriculture and mining and has told other countries worried about rising deforestation under his watch to mind their own business. An international outcry has prompted Norway and Germany to halt donations to Brazil's Amazon Fund, which supports many environmental NGOs as well as government Government agencies. There have also been calls for Europe to block a trade deal with Brazil and other South American nations. Rosa Licoz, UNTV News and Rescue.
Hong Kong's Yuen Long MTR station is back to normal on Thursday after a night of scuffles and chaos between protesters and police to mark the one-month anniversary of a mob attack on demonstrators. Some commuters on Thursday blamed the police for turning up to the sit-in protest causing protesters to set up barricades, while others urged protesters to calm down. Thousands of Hong Kong residents held an anti-government protest on Wednesday at a suburban subway station that was attacked by a mob last month. Angry that nobody has yet been prosecuted for the violence. Plans to begin repatriating the thousands of Rohingya Muslims who fled ethnic cleansing in the Rakhine state in 2017 look likely to fail once again, with the refugees refusing to go back to Myanmar voluntarily. This report explains why. Over 3,000 Rohingya were placed on a list of refugees and approved for repatriation as part of a fresh attempt by the governments of Bangladesh and Myanmar to start sending back some of the more than 1 million refugees living in squalid camps in Cox's Bazar. Bangladesh's Refugee Relief and Repatriation Commissioner Abul Kalam said on Wednesday that transportation and logistical assistance was on standby for any refugees who wanted to cross the border on 22nd of August, the given date for repatriation creations to begin today 235 fam families family uh, the representatives of the 235 families appeared for interview and expressed their opinion freely so the uh, the opinions expressed by the interviews are being processed now into the system it will take some time to collect and collate the data into the system so we are waiting for them and we are also fully ready for the uh, the repatriation process tomorrow However, a Bangladesh refugee relief official who was present during the intention surveys led by UNHCR said they did not find a single family willing to return to Myanmar on Thursday. Today, UNHCR staff interviewed me, asked me whether I will go back to my home. I replied, we want our rights, security, free movement, like the people in other communities. Then we will go. We have not come here to stay, but we face too much torture there. We fear returning to the same situation, but if we get a guarantee of peace, and if we Muslims can move freely, then we will go back. With nothing but our lives, we came to Bangladesh. Here in Bangladesh, we have shelter now. We have a little peace. Now they want to send us back. Please, it is better to kill us here. But don't send us to that country of brutal people. Better to give us poison. I will die drinking that poison. I will take poison, but will not go back. Previous attempts at persuading Rohingya to return to Rakhine have failed due to opposition from refugees. An effort in November sowed fear and confusion in the camps and finally failed after protests. A senior Bangladeshi official said recently that the new effort was a small-scale repatriation plan, adding that nobody will be forced to return. Tens of thousands of Rohingya remain inside Myanmar, confined to camps and villages across Rakhine State, where they are denied citizenship and their movements restricted. The UN has said conditions in Rakhine State, where government troops have been fighting an insurgency for months, are not conducive for the return of refugees. A UN investigator said in July that human rights violations against civilians by security forces and insurgents may amount to fresh war crimes, citing reports of deaths during army interrogations. Kat Dumaraos, UNTV News and Rescue. And those are the news from the other parts of the globe. Back to you, William. Thank you very much. Kat Dumaraos reporting live from Bangkok, Thailand. As audio production moves away from the simplicity of producing for two-channel stereo and towards a more intricate and immersive world, an audio production tool allows users to create surround sound audio by manipulating sound sources in a virtual reality environment. Jovic Burmas details why. 
A graduate from London's Royal College of Art has created a music mixing tool which allows people to go inside the mixing desk using virtual reality. Volta, which requires Oculus Rift or HTC Vive virtual reality equipment, makes tracks such as drums, backing vocals, and lead guitars appear as floating spheres to the user. Using VR controllers, the user can move the spheres, changing the perceived orientation of the sound. They can also raise and lower the volume of tracks, record and playback their movement around the user. Volta is a spatial audio production platform that you, that you use in virtual reality. And effectively, you can build a whole track, you could build an orchestra around you. The tool was Kane's thesis project, which he has been working on for just over a year. It works alongside digital audio workstations, connects to any audio production software, and requires a virtual studio technology plugin. Of having these abstractions like knobs and sliders you could use your body to compose and and to produce and to mix and and make it make the production process itself more expressive volta is still in development and is being piloted with music artists kane forces it being available to the public in a year's time when he also expects it to work on augmented reality glasses Jovic Burmas, UNTV News and Rescue, London, United Kingdom. And for the first time in nearly 15 years, remarkable new images from the Titanic wreck site show the ill-fated liner's deterioration on the North Atlantic seabed. Nina Armilio details why. Video and photographs taken by high-powered, specially adapted cameras captured images of the bacteria-eaten Titanic ship at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean about 400 miles off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada. Explorer Victor Viscovo is leading a mission to the bottom of the five oceans. Known as the Five Deeps Expedition, Viscovo pilots a special submersible vehicle that took more than three years to build. The mission 12,500 feet to the bottom of the ocean captured the first images of the sunken British passenger liner in 14 years. Viscovo said the team made a total of five dives to the wreck over eight days in early August. Uh, first impressions, it's big. It is a big wreck. I wasn't fully ready for just how large it was and uh, when it came up on sonar it really stood out while underwater the team performed photogrammetry passes on the ship that information will be used to make 3d models for use on augmented reality and virtual reality platforms the images will also help scientists predict how the wreck will continue to deteriorate but it was it was just extraordinary just to, to see it all and the most uh, amazing moment came when I was going along the side of the Titanic and the bright lights of the submersible the first time when they reflected off of a portal and came right back. It was like the ship was winking at me. It was, it was really amazing. On April 10, 1912, the Titanic set sail on its maiden voyage, traveling from Southampton, England to New York. On board were a number of prominent people, including American businessman Benjamin Guggenheim, British journalist William Thomas Ted, and Macy's department store co-owner Isidore Strauss and his wife, Ida. The liner struck an iceberg late on April 14 and sank in the early hours of April 15, 1912. Of the 2,223 passengers and crew aboard the ship, dubbed unsinkable before departure, 1,517 died. Nina Armilio, UNTV News and Rescue. Meanwhile, the New Zealand Parliament invited a special guest onto the chamber floor Wednesday, a newborn baby. The country's parliamentary speaker, Trevor Mallard, held and fed the one-month-old son of lawmaker Tamati Coffey while presiding over a debate. Video show Mallard rocking the baby as he listened to the debate at one point. He warns a lawmaker that their time had run out, followed by a gurgle of agreement from the baby. 
People on social media were quick to praise Mallard and Coffee. Last year, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern made history becoming the first world leader in nearly 30 years to have a child while in office. She later returned to her job while her partner Clark Gayford became a stay-at-home dad. Two on-ground additionees at the Davao City leg of the Wishcovery Originals prove that disability and struggles in life must not be a hindrance in reaching one's dream. Janice Ingente shares why. Michael Deacon went blind after acquiring glaucoma 15 years ago, but visual impairment has not stopped him from writing his own songs. Of his 50 compositions, he performed one on the Wish 1075 bus. He is one of the auditionees at the Wish Cover Originals on ground auditions in Davao City. <laughs> Ang aming isip, uh, patungkol sa mga bagay-bagay. While Elaine Tabamo, a food vendor, shared she did not hesitate to join the auditions when she found out about it. She even borrowed a guitar from another participant just to finally showcase her song composition. Wala po akong instrument, so thank you sa nagpahiram sa akin ng instrument um, para makapag-perform. She asked me na mag-borrow daw siya ng gitara. So as a ano, fellow artist din, so of course, I had to let her borrow the guitar din. Michael and Elaine are living proof that despite disability and struggles in life, a door of opportunity opens. Just desire and pray for it, and your wish will be granted. Janice Enhente, UNTV, News and Rescue, Davao City. And those are the reasons behind the news this August 22, 2019. On behalf of Alex Baltazar and Angelo Castro III, I am William Theo, and before we close, we will recap with today's significant sound bites. Because we need to know, we will always ask why. Good evening. Preliminary, because there are a lot of involvement in some not good behaviors. Maybe not. That's really the problem. You may not really qualify to go home today or in the next few months. Mukang di siya mapapasok. Kung talagang ipipilit nila, I would assist the Sarmienta family to bring the case before the regular courts. Ikwa question natin yung exercise of that discretion to release Antonio Sanchez. Mas a classified na heinous crime, hindi dapat mag-qualify. Dapat reclusion perpetua ka. Total, ayaw nyo ng death penalty. O sige, reclusion perpetua ka. You die in your cell. If we have any concern on the wisdom of the law, then it should be addressed to the lawmakers. That law was passed during the administration of President Benigno Aquino. We look forward to the timely passage of the 2020 national budget so as not to derail our next year's economic growth. Fire of another will never run out of those. And uh, in doing so, please make it explicit, the message, and to drop diplomatic language. So whether you like it or not, will it make you happy or not, angry or otherwise, I'm sorry. But we have to talk the arbitrary ruling.